Today was the reading session for my new piece, uh, Down the Rivers of the Windfall Light. The title of this piece, it actually comes from a line from a poem by Dylan Thomas uh, called Fern Hill. This poem deals with an evocation of childhood. So it's, uh, it's really a very nostalgic look back uh, to an idyllic and, and somewhat fantastic uh, image of childhood. And the, the line itself uh, is in a broader context. He's sort of painting this image of a trail of leaves and flowers just blowing along and uh, he's describing the light playing al along it as though it was a river. For me, what was one of the wonderful things about this subject was that he seemed to be portraying childhood uh, and in particular its unselfconscious aspect, um, by which I mean there's this aspect of childhood uh, that we all love because we get to play and we get to explore. And I think that as we grow older, we lose a little bit of that. I mean, we replace it with a kind of reflectiveness and we're able to sort of see ourselves in the third person a bit more, which is enormously useful. But we lose a bit of the innocence and the sense of play. And I feel like this loss is represented to very powerful effect uh, in this poem. And I wanted to capture at least a little bit of that uh, in the music that I wrote. Before I started writing this piece, uh, I was in the midst of creating sketches for the piece I thought I was going to write. And I had lots of ideas and I was taking long walks in the country, literally in the country, and trying to think of ways of exploring my identity through music. And nothing was sticking, like nothing was, was really, really working for me. Um, and I think that composition is a process that's primarily intuitive for me. And, uh, and if I feel like something is working, then I'll go with it. And I think the rational part that says this is what this piece is about, that comes a little bit later for me uh, in the process. So I think what was interesting is that when I read this line in this poem, I was gripped by it in a way that I couldn't articulate in any ver verbal way. And I think that was what I put my trust into. So when, uh, once I actually saw this poem and I started to read it and, and get closer to it, and I made the decision to pursue this subject, uh, then I started to think about why I was doing it. But, but to be really honest, I did it because I was compelled to do it at first. And then um, I think that composition is, is a funny thing because it reflects parts of ourselves that we may not be able to necessarily put into words. The feedback I received from the reading session seemed to be pretty positive overall. I got a few comments from Peter that were very helpful. I think with regards to uh, things like orchestration and texture and, and um, it was very helpful for me because sometimes I don't even know what happened during the reading sessions. The English horn player uh, actually emailed me the night before with a couple notes uh, of concern about one of his solos. Um, this piece actually has a lot of solos sections. Uh, almost every single principal wind uh, and brass has an important solo in this piece and, and it so happens that the English horn gets one of the very last solos of the piece. And uh, he asked me about the very last note of the solo because he felt like the solo had musically said all it had to say before the last note. And I thought that was an inc incredibly astute observation and, and I also wasn't quite sure if he was right or not because I wanted to hear it. And, and so I, I kind of sent him a, a reply that took into account the fact that I hadn't heard the piece yet. And during the reading session, um, I heard it and then he approached me after the reading session and he mentioned, he brought this up again and he said um, he thought that that last note didn't quite uh, fit because it was, somehow it seemed like an afterthought. And I told him, uh, Carrie, you're exactly right. Uh, this last note happens when the strings come back in. Before that, uh, the English horn is sort of by itself. There's a few, you know, mutterings from the harp and from a couple other instruments, but it's, it's basically on its own. And then when the strings come back, they take over. And he's still playing when the strings come back. And I think that he was concerned about that because it, it just seemed like it had said all it had to say. So uh, I decided to take it out. And that's an example of, of something that is, is so useful to have a musician actually come back and, and tell you 
you know, my solo could go this way and uh, for that to make a lot of sense. So I, I did it. I often don't know what my piece is about until the premiere or in some cases well after the premiere, like months. Um, because it's, it's when you're dealing with the subject, you're too close to it to really know what it is. And I prefer to be close to it because there's an exploratory aspect in that as well and there's the process of composing, which I find to be deeply engaging just from a process point of view. But I don't know what the piece is about until I've heard it uh, many times, sometimes. And I think that every time I hear the piece, um, it sets my mind in motion as to what piece I'm going to write next. And very often the piece I'm going to write next is a way of addressing some of the issues I have with the current piece. And so um, when I wrote Tree Ship and when I heard it performed uh, a couple times, I started to have an inkling of what my next piece would be, which eventually became Down the Rivers of the Windfall Light. And when I heard this piece at the reading session, I immediately had a sense of what my third piece was going to be.